Right. Appreciate y'all for coming out tonight. Welcome to the Triangle Blockchain and Business Meetup. Tonight we have Sam Penfield. He's an advisory solutions architect at SAS with over 20 years of experience as a consultant and a software developer. Today he's going to be talking to us about blockchain analytics, so let's give him a nice round of applause. I'll just give you a little uh, idea of how long I've been doing software development. My first programming job, I made three dollars and seventy-five cents an hour, and I thought I'd die and one to heaven because all my friends were making half that. I was a freshman in college doing Fortran, integral calculus with Fortran. Anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about blockchain analytics. I'm going to give you a little background of what we're doing at SAS. About two years ago, they asked me to take a look at Bitcoin. There was a lot of rumblings at the time, and I don't know how many, how many people are SAS programmers or have the experience with it? Oh, yeah, all right. Yes. Okay, so this won't be too, uh, too far for some of you. Um, I've been programming SAS for over 20 years, but um, they asked me to take a look at Bitcoin at the time, and I think it was like $250 of Bitcoin at the time, so I'll give you how long ago. And one of the two of the reasons they wanted me to look at it was for, you know, obviously for analytics from a perspective of how do you use it with uh, to do types of numerical or ledger type analytics. And the second thing was is actually the regulatory side of it. Because at the time there was a lot of question about AML and we have a lot of regulatory products. So I started taking a look at Bitcoin and I did a little presentation for them. Then I took it a little further. I went decided to take the Bitcoin blockchain and put it in SAS data sets. Well, five terabytes later, I decided that wasn't probably a good idea. Because <laughs> by the time you get all the links, if you've done anything with the Bitcoin blockchain, you know, it's very, um, it's binary and it's, it's links and links and links and links. So if you track that and try to do any kind of uh, relational model on that, it's, it can be challenging. So I, the next step was I said I need to find an ID where I can pull data from. So I found the WikiLeaks ID. And WikiLeaks, back in 2013, was kicked off of PayPal. So they went to Bitcoin. So the, they probably have multiple addresses, but I found one of their primary donation addresses. So I pulled all the transactions for, for um, WikiLeaks, all 28,000 at the time. I'm sure there's a lot more now. And I put those into SAS data sets and I did reporting how much, you know, analytics on how much they were spending a month, how much they were spending a quarter. They were running about $40,000 in and out of uh, Bitcoin. So donations in and they were using it for pulling it out somehow or transferring it to another Bitcoin account. So I found that kind of be interesting. One thing I also noticed about it was that you could get relay information, right? You know, Bitcoin and you trans when you use a wallet and you don't put a transaction on the network, it goes to a relay. And the relay has an IP address. So you can actually get that information. So then I use that to get about longitude and latitude. The next thing you know, I had information about WikiLeaks, and I said, how about if I put it into our visual investigator product, which the FBI uses, police departments use. So when they go out and try to do a case against someone, they can actually pull data in from Facebook, LinkedIn, so I said, what if I add value by putting some of this uh, Bitcoin data into it? So I did. And the next thing I know, I have a map drawn because I had all these lap lawns in there of where all their money was basically coming from. And believe it or not, the majority was the United States. A lot in Europe, but most, there was a lot more red dots or little <coughs> location dots in the United States. So I looked at that and and I presented that, so just to prove that we could use some of our existing products with Bitcoin data, and what are the type of things we could use it for. So I, didn't, I started taking a look at blockchains in general. So what I did is I separated them out into two categories. Public blockchains, which are cryptocurrencies, and then the permission, what we call private type blockchains, hyperledger chains, R3 cores, and that. So I want to take a look at which ones we really play well in. When you look at regulatory side of it, public blockchains are important to us for anti money laundering, for fraud detection, and things of that nature. But the real place that I felt that we can do with SAS and 
connect into these blockchains was on the permission side. So that was, you know, it was implemented inside uh, firewalls and, you know, known identity. There's just lots of uh, POC projects going on in healthcare, supply chain, and things of that nature. So who cares about this? Well, from a regulatory perspective, I met with the Securities and Exchange Commission about two months ago, and they're worried about these ICOs. And the reason they're worried about them is because you and I could probably create one in a day and send emails out to everybody that we know to ask for money. And they're really worried that people are going to lose their fortunes because they think they're going to become cryptocurrency millionaires. <clears throat> so those, as of yesterday, there were 1,730 cryptocurrencies. But Bitcoin takes a still is 47 percent of the capital. China, and Japan are pushing KYC and AML. Everybody knows what KYC is. Know your customer. That's what banks have to do when you go ask for an account. They have a, they have regulations on know your customer. There's a lot of things they have to ask. They check to see if you're on the uh, terrorist watch list and all that stuff. They also check to make sure you don't own any homes in Cuba or things of that nature. So there's a lot of that stuff. So KYC and AML, these are the two regulatory things that are going on with cryptocurrencies. They're just trying to say, how does it work? Now the thing about AML, if anybody's used a SaaS AML product, it's just but a fancy rules engine. So if you can get transactions into it, you can write rules for cryptocurrencies. The problem is, where did they come from? And are you sure that it's actually not just a transfer to someone else or they're actually withdrawing money and things of that nature. That's what makes it a little bit difficult. But at the end of the day, they're just transactions. 27 states are currently in uh, the U.S. are working on regulations on these cryptocurrencies. So it's, it's big news. Blockchain projects, there's lots of them. Hyperledger, I've been looking at it closely. And oh, I just down, I just compiled R3 Corda. Uh, so I'm looking at how we integrate with a lot of these things with uh, SaaS products. And you know, I don't. Does anybody go to the uh, consensus conference in New York City? Eight thousand people were there. It's crazy. They need a bigger venue, but you see, those are a lot of people who were there. Deloitte actually helps, was one of the prime sponsors for that. So, from SaaS's perspective, what do we do with blockchain? So. Two perspectives, our SAS Bio, which is our new version of SAS, you know, we can work on any pretty much any data. You might have to write some Python code to get it out so you can use it, but at the end of the day, it's all immutable data and you can access it. Not true for all of them. Like R3 Corda actually doesn't do a central blockchain, for example. And the other side of it is a bench stream process. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit mostly about today. Now, how do we pull events out of a blockchain? and actually consume it and do analytics on the events versus trying just to capture the data. <clears throat> From our perspective, it's, it's different than SQL data store. I don't know if you've SAS, you've done a lot of proc SQL with SAS. It does connects to all kinds of data sources. Um, mostly no, no SQL key value data stores. <clears throat> I think Hyperledger has changed their data store three times in about two years. Um, and the IoT side of it, you know, how do you handle IoT speeds? And I'm going to, we're going to do a little demonstration at the end here, and you'll see that we can actually handle how some possibilities of handling IoTs. And again, we're focusing really on a lot, both analytics and regulatory requirements. So my goals on this were really more tactical and strategic. I wanted to use existing products so that we could actually get to work in some of this blockchain, the wild, wild west of blockchain. The thing I'm noticing about blockchain is like a hammer and nail. When you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But I want to develop an analytics model that's reusable, so that's basically how I started out this. So I created a blockchain, and here are my caveats. It's not a ledger. It's not distributable. No security on it, just put anything you want in it. And it's not a problem, which I have to tell a lot of people that's nice. So the bottom line on this is this basically slides with the approach is we needed a non-intrusive form of analytics to track 
tracks activity events, miners, consensus, or any part of the blockchain to do, to do content reporting. So, in, in looking at this, I had to put together, I, I had to pick a blockchain, and I didn't know which one to pick. There's so many of them. There's probably 20 open source blockchains. So I decided to pick, uh, to write my own, and I basically wrote one that's functionally the same as a blockchain, but it's not, it doesn't, from a performance perspective, it does everything. It's private, public keys, it does all that through the whole blockchain. And it actually reports into what we call our event stream processing engine. So I used, I created a, um, my consensus is based on request response from the streaming engine. Has anybody read my blog? Did you see my blog? It's just not going to skip that one. So my approach here on this whole thing was high throughput real time. If you can attach to a blockchain, you cannot be intrusive on it. That's just the bottom line. You've got to be, be fast. I wanted, to have, uh, I wanted to be able to plug in my, I created a, um, my blockchain is basically a simulator. So you could actually connect into it different uh, topologies. You want to be able to plug in different approaches. 100% cluster based and it's analytics by design. So my approach is how do I get analytics out of this? And of course that's the SP, that's right off our website now. That's our event stream processing engine. It's very fast and has all the analytics that SAS has are built into the event stream processing. So you don't have to go anywhere. Once you get the data in there, you can do all types of analytics. So I implemented a pluggable blockchain, open source technologies. I used uh, the elliptical curve stuff that Bitcoin used. It's all the, all the same. I did the hash 256, same as Bitcoin. So it's all pretty much uh, done like that. If you look at the SaaS ecosystem, this is how we look, view look at getting data from a blockchain in SaaS. And you can access APIs from various blockchains. Again, we're focusing on the enterprise side, of this, not so much the uh, public side. And we look at pulling data out of the different processes in the blockchains and putting them into the SaaS ecosystem, which you can see here, you can pretty much do add it to anything, customer intelligence, which is another application, our fraud security intelligence. We have a lot of apps. So this is, I took a layered approach to this, and this is my little blockchain right here. I'm working on the contract side of it, maybe do some smart contracts with it. But the bottom line is we have connectors to Hyperledger chain, looking at Ethereum. Right now I'm actually doing Hyperledger and R3, and also the ability to do IoT. Our blockchain, because it does request response from our ESP engine, is very fast. So my block updates are about at 50 milliseconds, and my uh, records are going in at 9 milliseconds. The stream event processing provides a consensus in this case, but it also has a whole side of deep learning. So one thing I thought would be really cool is if I can feed back to the blockchain how it's performing, maybe add more processes, a lot of maybe Kubernetes type processes. We can also do all types of data, AI deep learning. So if you have a ledger that's feeding data in or people are interacting with and you're getting revenue from, where's all the revenue coming from? Where, where, what parts of your blockchain are performing the best, which are not being used that much? It's a lot of operational type. You can also report on the data itself. And of course, they added the presentation layer, which is the stream viewer, which you can pretty much, it's, you can look at anything that's in our event stream processing and right from the stream. My first version, topology, sound familiar from the storm people? Then you guys use storage. Would you mind going back to how is your deep learning integrated with your blockchain? So, <clears throat> what's happening is right now the blockchain is feeding events in the stream process, okay. all types. Okay. And it has a, you can do AI inside of our stream learning. So, in the case of deep learning, I'm watching the events coming from all the processes in the blockchain. So what's happening is it can evaluate that and then feedback, slow the processes down, speed them up, or maybe even introduce them. So it's auto-learning, essentially, 
it's, it's still structured data. Yes. It's auto learning, depending on the events. And feeding back things. Okay. So, so what I've done, in, what I've done inside the streaming engine is, uh, inside my processes, my miners don't. Everything's pushed to the miners, and the miners have a configuration that sits inside the ESP. Mm -hmm. so deep learning can change that configuration, and it's constantly reading it. So the miners and the consensus process all can adjust. Now, one of the things people I don't think are looking at future-wise with blockchains is what are you going to have 10 years from now when somebody has four blockchains? How are you going to do analytics on four blockchains? So I really think this type of approach offers that thing. Those uh, kind of capabilities, so you can actually have a single form of analytics across many blockchains. Anything else? So this is my first version. It's built on top of Storm and ESP. Uh, my blockchain is actually in MongoDB, and I just thought there was too many servers in this. I thought of the nice idea about this was I could change the topologies out and change my blockchain. As long as I use the same event process. This is what an ESP model looks like. You can see this is the response request just for the, uh, the minor consensus process. You can see how each one of them makes requests to, inside the event stream. The event stream is a pub sub environment, so when you put something in a window, someone else gets a request from it. So the, mine, the, the consensus process is handing tokens out to these miners. So only one miner can update the blockchain. It's all done through reading pub sub the ESP. So my first UI, you can see I got miners, consensus process, and clients, which the miner IDs would be there. I had a little uh, block request there, transactions per block, request rates. These are all analytics that are coming right off the blockchain. And all this is coming right out of SAS ESP, because so once the events get in there, it's exactly where. So you can put any event you want in there to pretty much track it. And you can see right there, it's pretty fast. Those are milliseconds now. And I also had the capability, you can pause any one of the miners. You can pause any one of the clients just by clicking that. All it does is post a configuration message to the event stream processing that the, that the clients are plugged up to. They basically pull the events on. So it, it, it works completely downstream to all the miners. So version one, Basically, it's a memory-based blockchain. I proved that our event stream process could handle consensus. And this is a new version. So I have these clients, no controllers, and they're both written in Go. And the miners are written in a JDM. The reason I use a JDM is because ESP Pub subs by Python, by uh, Java, and by C++. JVM was what I had it, what I was comfortable with. Inside ESP, everything's in Windows. So that's what W stands for. So when a miner, all the miners are talking to the node controllers, clients come in and does a round robin distribution of the miners, pass them on. This process has a private public key. This process has a private public key. The miner has a private public key. And ESP can do joins like a database can. So you can actually put data in here, and if someone were to send events in there that didn't match an existing registered process, it'll just drop. It'll never make it through the join. So it basically does registration. So the first thing anyone in this process do when they start up is they set a registration. So let's talk a little bit about IoT. This is an IoT device. By morning, semiconductor. This thing has all types of azimuth information, acceleration, kind of like your cell phone. It has a button on it, you can push it and start and stop it. I was hoping to have that demonstrated tonight, but because of the networking, um, this is off the network of SAS, so I can't, there's no way I can get it on this network, but I can demonstrate how it works. So I actually ran it through Raspberry Pi doing Bluetooth here, web sockets to the client, and the client dumps the transactions. This dumps the transactions out at nine milliseconds, every nine milliseconds. And 
and I am updating the blockchain every 50 milliseconds with, with 50, 50 transactions. So I can get, if I were to get this up and running and we were to rotate it, I can show you on the graph how it does the activity, the analytics side of it, the blockchain will get to about 15,000 events in maybe about three minutes. To give you an idea. And I can connect to a node. So each one of them goes to the client. But I can actually run the client code on the node because it's just Go language. I haven't done that. So another thing here at SAS is there's three people working on this me, myself, and I. <laughs> if for some reason, it decides to make me a product manager. So my new UI looks more like this, where you can actually click on any of these. Uh, these are your clients. You can see the last four bits of their public key are shown here. And in the case of router dealer, shows you the difference of port numbers that they're using. So they all connect through this. I've got them running in Docker right now, moving over to Kubernetes, so that I can just basically start up these things in mass. Um, and each one of these clients, right now the only client, I have two clients, one is for this IoT device, and I have one for what's called bike share. I'll show you the bike share data right there. So this, as you know, Bitcoin uses what's called the Koblenz curve. Sec P two fifty six K one, there's one that's called S1, it's supposed to be better. <laughs> I just used this because the libraries were there. <laughs> the libraries is all written for you. Um, everything's automatic private key. So if I were to give you a client and you wanted to test it on your laptop, as soon as you run the process, it generates you a private key. So that becomes your private key from then on. Um, every component has um, public private key. So you know all your nodes, you know all your controllers, you know all your um, every transaction is signed and hashed at every single point, and it verifies the transaction from the previous point. If it gets to the miner and something happens, it gets it gives a fail to the client, so the client knows to resubmit the transaction. It hasn't happened yet. I also have a heartbeat going back and forth between the miners and the clients, just in case when one fails, you can go right away, and it will reflect on that UI issue. Uses identity and ESP. The nice thing about ESP, you can treat it like a database. So I, you don't want to put a lot in there, but you know, as far as these components go, I use a public key for all these, these guys. Um, so the interesting thing was when I first did these, I didn't take the ID off of here and put it in the data. So all of a sudden, I had this blockchain full of data from these devices, but they had I didn't know where the source was, which is pretty cool if you think about it because it was just a public key, it was hash, so you couldn't change it without breaking the hash. So you were guaranteed integrity of data and it had an anonymity. So if you look at like hospital devices, and someone decides to put a blockchain on a hospital and merge your room, you have all these devices feeding data into your blockchain. You can take that data and give it back to the vendor, because it's all public private key at that point from the device, they know it's from their device, but they don't know if it's my heart rate or my blood pressure. They don't know the identity of the user, so it gives you some power with this information. And I, some of the healthcare people, I think, like the idea of being able to sell the state. So I found it out the hard way, because then I looked at this, where did it come from? So I went back and added the ID. So I knew it would be. Um, all, all process validating the signature. Um, I suggest more of the same stuff. All clients, clients originate all transactions with the exception of registration. Generating the heartbeat process with all the, the router process. And blah, 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 blah. Same with the Same with the miner. Receives updates via ESP. The ESP engine tells it when it's, it's turned up the blockchain and sends it ready for when it's complete. It sends it ready to complete back and then it hands the token to the next miner. I have a UI server that it doesn't touch the blockchain at all. So it does read data out of ESP. So it's got nothing 
if once you get the events into ESP and the event stream processing, you pretty much that's where all your analytics are. So you don't have to worry about affecting going touching any of the blockchain data. And I use WebSockets for the clients. Oh, here's my technologies. My blockchain is MongoDB. I actually bought some of their stock. Um, GRPC, I used it. I don't know if used that. It's a great, great library. Actually, it's streaming built into it. It's used between all processes. So, and you can actually uh, use TLS with, with, with GRPC pretty easily. Again, I told them to talk about the cryptography, which is the Copeland's curve. Bouncing past the library for Java, and my hash is just standard SHA 256. There's lots of those libraries. This is my to do list when I'm working on way. I want to rework consensus a little bit so I can have more than one. Uh, enhancing uh, ESP model. I'm going to add some more AI DL to the trend, not only the operational data, but also to the data itself being fed into the because my blockchain is not a ledger. It can pretty much, anything you send, it goes in the blockchain. I don't care what, what clients you have, if they're valid clients, you can put any data in the blockchain. I'm going to add ledger to it, but I've got two registrations and what's called a payload right now. I like the, I've connected IoT devices, so I put a line through that one. And I like to look at maybe doing some SaaS programs in, the, in the smart contracts. And I have completed the Docker base for our sales team. So our sales team, they're getting a lot of questions about blockchain. Uh, I want to put this, I really put this together so they can demo some of the analytics capabilities that you might be interested in. And the nice thing about this model is in ESP, and it's XML model. It has Windows, and it has all the analytics in it. You can move this to pretty much in any blockchain. This is not really as long as it gets the events in there that it wants, you can pretty much do it. So, get out of here. This is connect my Raspberry Pi here. And what I'll do, let's go into See that the bottom's cut off a little bit. There's one on the on your right. So let's turn the device on. Oh. So let me turn it on. Discovered it, started, and now it's doing information as I rotate it. So you can see how quickly it's demonstrating. I don't have this open the blockchain, I have another process of this modification of this code. I can push the stop button. And now it'll start up other types of sensors. You can see raw data from it. So operator, gyroscope, compass, rotating, you can see those numbers change. It's a lot more fun when you load it into blockchain at this speed and then you show the analytics side of it. But because I don't can't cook, hook the pie to the same network I can't show it, right? So at this speed I'm not able to actually load the blockchain. All this data goes in both the ESP and the blockchain. So you can watch the graph and watch the analytics.
light share, I can say, yeah, could you shorten the height? Oh, yeah, yeah, Shorten yeah. the, the height-wise so that we can't side? Absolutely. And that's that. For, for the windows that you're going to show? Yep. Thanks. Let's see if I can make it a little bigger. That's it. Ooh. Yeah. Technology. Old, 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 old guy like that. Nice. Thank you. But you can see, this is a client I have. So this is a help screen that I've built into it. There's a configuration file, which has the private key in it. If it doesn't exist, it creates one. I can take YAML or props. I do everything with YAML. You can tell how many, how often you want the heartbeat between the, uh, to the network controller. And you can specify the number of records so you can test. You can put a lot in there and put a few. This actually reads data off the web, transportation data off the website. And uh, sometimes it works fast, sometimes it doesn't. I'm going to run it now. Let's, see. let's do, uh, let's just put a hundred, let's just run it. See? There. So in 1.9 seconds, it loaded 100 transactions from the blockchain. So we can go look at the blockchain now. See what our block can is up to two now. So there's only, I only put 100 in there, and there's two blocks, each one has 50. So let me show you the last one. Can I shorten this one too? Yeah, sure. I'm sorry. So I wanted to be able to do everything a normal blockchain would do, 
because I want to do the hashing. I wanted to create private keys. I wanted to see what the burden would be if I just did that, those things. So I, because I was afraid that if I did it this way, that I may burn, I may put undue pressure on the blockchain <coughs> itself. You don't want to do that when you're doing analytics. You just want it to be transparent. So that's why I did it this way. Okay. So, and I can adjust the speeds of this. I can change the configurations on it. So I can adjust it to make it look like Bitcoin every 10 minutes or make it look like Hyperledger, I think it's in three minutes or two minutes. And then, you know, R3 Corda, they don't even use one blockchain. They don't do a broadcast of transactions. They basically do one-to-one um, -one transactions that create vaults, which are just like mini blockchains. So you and I can send a transaction to each other, and no one else would know that. So you want to track that from an event perspective so that you can just let be notified that that event happened. You don't really, it's, you know, especially in the enterprise type of way. So the simulation that you created uh, and the AI and deep learning, everything that you created, how did, did that, or would it help you with the a, uh, AML problems that a bank would suffer or any other institution would suffer? Because I would like to think worked in AML for a while and, sure, I, sure. and I what I realized the need for the kind of algorithms was anomaly detection. Right. And would this And help that's that? all they are is a bunch of rules, right? Right, right. right. So, so would this help that? Not really because this is more on the enterprise side. I really you're talking about more on the cryptocurrency and the actual ledger side of it. Okay. I I that that is purely a read out of the blockchain type of environment. I just wanted to offer people the opportunity to use uh, to do analytics, high-level analytics, quickly. And this really, you know, I've used ESP before for projects with train companies. They put these things, in, they put ESP in cars, they put it in, you know, all kinds of things. Okay. It's in, uh, Cisco has a ESP, the bench <coughs> processing engine built into their devices, their IoT devices. So when I told them I had a blockchain that could do IoT speeds, they were all excited about it. But, uh, again, I, my intent wasn't to build a blockchain. My intent was to see yeah. So, uh, you showed in your configuration slide that you had miners and you could control how uh, how many miners you had versus the clients, etc. What I was what I was curious about was you've got lots of data going in going into the into your in your blockchain simulated. and simulated and and where what is the effect or where would we see the effect of miners actually working on the working on the uh, data that goes into the blockchain. But, you know, when, when, does, it, when does it get... Uh, well, so what happens is every time they do any activity, they put an event into the event stream processing. So you know what the miners have updated. You know all the readings. You know how much time it took between the ready and the complete. So you know all that information is a part of it. And that's, that's in your output? It's in uh, it's in the actual ESP engine, and I don't have a stream viewer, so I can't show you uh, what it would look like. But I wanted to do that, but I just can't do it because you're getting you're getting you know, tremendously fast throughput, yeah. throughput, and and usually miners, depending upon the you know proof of work, what what's required, take take a bit of time. Right. So mine's not proof of work. Mine's request response. So miner says I want to update. My consensus is just ask the ESP. I want to update the blockchain. And it waits for a token. It keeps looking, it's subscribed to another table in there that the consensus goes in there saying, here, and it gives you your ID, your public key, and it says it's your turn to update the blockchain. Okay. And it will not, consensus will not release another request for another miner to you have said, I'm done. So it's, it's more state than. Yeah, it maintains it maintain state in there. Okay. But you know, you know. That's just for the signal. Okay. You know, if you were to put it on the hyperledger, you could get rid of that whole part of it. You could get rid of my watching. You could not need that. You could just basically use the tables I've used to track transactions and all that the data side of it, the operational side of it. But I, again, I did this because, one, if I had to pick one of those blockchains and I had to learn it, I, it would have taken me so long to get into it. So I just said, you know, I'm just going to create a bare bones blockchain. It does all the same functionality. I don't care if it scales, I don't care about identity security. All I care about is functionality. That's what, that's what I mean. So it really is a 
true for more than three years. So I, I must admit that I, uh, I missed your session uh, prior to coming to here because looking at the title and you from SAS, I assume that you, your session is actually talking about doing analytics on blockchain versus trying to simulating the blockchain and trying to understand the anatomy and well, I'm using analytics on it. If I can bring up the UI, I can show you the analytics. Yeah, so my, my, my question to you is this. Uh, have, have, you, have, you any, have you had any thoughts on uh, what kind of analytics would be appropriate to do on a blockchain network? Yeah, so I, I've got a group. That would be great. I've got a group of uh, people that are PhD and other or well, follow up. Yeah. <laughs> follow so what up. I'm trying to do is work with them and, and get some of this, this deep learning stuff put in. It was their idea to use deep learning. So okay. I'll schedule you. I'll schedule you for a research trial. Like yeah, yeah, it's SAS. So that you're, so that you're, you're yeah, in. Yeah, so that you're in. Yeah. I wish we could have done this in SAS. We could have done this. I could have shown you know, all this stuff. Really, yeah. 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 That would be very yeah, I'd be glad to do that. I want to get to that. I'm just not there. I'm just, it's not that far off. Like I said, I'm doing the work in the industry. So I've, I've got input from those folks. I just got to get it to the point where they can actually do some modeling. That, that's a plan. But they're the ones who brought up what I could do with AI. We learning with this data as well as the population side of the project. How expensive and how durable are the little uh, Boxes, ah, they're pretty good. I mean, I got three of them. I think they last. This is what's called Bluetooth Low Energy. I can change the color one. <laughs> well, I'm just curious is the how the durability the durability. Of so these are the one devices. So this one is good. Yeah, yeah, once I get the data in, all the data in the ESP, 
they can do the analytics without me even knowing about it. Gotcha. And they just really need to process stuff. I'm a, I'm a programmer at heart. I've been doing this a long time. So, yeah. I guess this isn't really an analytics space, but since this is about blockchain technology, right. how long do you think it's going to be before we see an actual blockchain application that gets real support behind it? Especially something that maybe doesn't have a coin associated with it. Like, well, I think it's going to happen. And I think with Hyperledger people are going after that a bit because if you look at there's the biggest story is supply chain. They move through from Florida to New York, goes to 13 companies, and thirty percent of it never gets to the And they were here, they actually talked about that here. So in those environments, all these devices are keeping track of temperature and the oranges or whatever they're shipping, they're not leisure transactions, they're just events. So, you know. The ledger transactions, maybe when they tra when it crosses company lines, I mean, you still have ledger transactions, but there's a whole side of it that's non ledger. So I think you're going to see a lot of these. At least my, especially with IoT, these devices don't aren't ledger transactions. In my opinion, I can tell you that a few banking applications already out there. There's some supply chain already out there. They can use a hyper ledger. And you just give us the interest I know that because I'm a legend fan. Okay. It's good stuff, it really is. It's good, it's good. It's good, it's a, good, it's a uh, I have it, I've actually compiled it. I've got a lot of my uh, EC2 instances. Do you have any information or like your knowledge of what's been updated in the medical device? Like, you know, only from what I've heard of the conferences. I don't, I don't have first hand knowledge, but you know, I really think that's like, you know, they're really, healthcare is working heavily from what I can see what I can. So that you can have your own blockchain of personal records. So when you get referred to another doctor, the doctor can send you what he needs to know and not, right, and not send it. I think they're really focused on that side of the device. But I see the devices really being big. That's what I'm looking for. I mean, devices. just this little device that I have running, I, you know, it tracks a lot of data really quickly. So, and I can go back and replay. What I wanted to do, I asked the people at work if they give me a drone. So I could fly the drone around the room with my blockchain, land it, and then let it fly backwards. Or I could put it back where it started. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, a little game more than anything else, but it proves the value of blockchain data. There is a, if you're interested, there is a startup up in Boston that I consulted for. It's called S S O T Health. Uh, we can just Google them. They're creating a product like what just Sam just said. Yeah. You know, we're not going to be, we're not going to create blockchains, but we are going to work on that. And that's why we do this. It's purely as a proof. Like,
a dozen businesses. You would, you would set up an agreement that says we're going, we're, we have to have so many, so many miners agree that this work actually got done. And so it's, it's, it's a proof of state, of state yeah. And, and so it's, it's a uh, consen consensus and you can establish within your consortium or business units or, or whatever, how many of those have to, have to agree. You know, not everybody has to participate, but you may say, of the seven, of the seven miners or validators, three have to, three or four have to uh, agree, and it's not always the same three or four. But of 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 those validators, a certain number have have to, and the work that it's done is usually not as much, it's not as computer intensive as Bitcoin's work. Yeah, there's also difficulty is what's causing the electrical usage. So because we have so many uh, miners on the network, difficulty ramps in order to protect that 10 minute period. So um, if there was only two miners in the world, using probably uh, more hours. So for closed systems like this, block closed blockchains, use it on any any type of server or any type of computer CPU. Um, so it's not, not necessarily about electricity. Something for like let's say a hospital, um, you can just simply utilize their their existing server room, uh, the CPU, probably a couple uh, threads per CPU. That's, that's about all the thing. Thank you. 